You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, my friends. Welcome to another edition of The Corbett Report. I am your host, James Corbett, podcasting to you, as always, from the sunny climes of western Japan on this 28th day of May, 2011. I'd like to welcome all the listeners to the podcast and invite them all, as always, to check into my website, CorbettReport.com, where you can find previous episodes of this podcast, as well as articles, interviews, and videos created and conducted by myself in the past, and links to other alternative media websites, like MediaMonarchy.com, that also provide valuable, independent, alternative news and information. On that note, of course, The Corbett Report is listener-supported alternative media, so once again, I would like to say that if you do enjoy The Corbett Report's work and find it informative, then please consider contributing to the cause by either purchasing a copy of my 2009 video archive, a DVD of compilation of various video clips created back in 2009, or you can subscribe on the subscribe tab by uh, clicking on the PayPal subscribe button and donating 100 Japanese yen a month, that's about $1 a month, to help continue getting this information out there. Of course, all of the media at CorbettReport.com is provided completely free of charge, so it is only the goodwill of the people who are listening that ensure that I am able to continue doing this. So once again, thank you to everyone who continues to support this podcast, both financially and also, uh, just as importantly, by continuing to get the word out about the information contained in this podcast. And on one programming note from last week's episode, those people who are subscribed via iTunes or another podcatcher might have noticed that their uh, version of episode 187 did not contain the Ron Paul speech that I said was going to end the episode. That was a mistake on my part. I accidentally left it off of the file uh, as it originally went out. I did correct that uh, the next day and put up the corrected file, but you may have the old file. So if you did not get to hear that Ron Paul speech, you can re-download the episode from CorbettReport.com, and it will contain that speech. But as always, we have so much information to get into today. A really exciting episode, so let's get straight into it. Welcome, my friends, to episode 188 of the Corbett Report podcast, Listening to the Enemy. And as you might be able to guess from that title, the central conceit of today's episode is not particularly difficult to grasp. In fact, it's so simple that even a child could likely understand it. And perhaps the key image for today's episode might be Bug Bailey sitting in his little room, hollowed out above Big Boy Caprice's office in the back room of his club, listening in on all of Big Boy's conversations. And for those of you who may not have been a 10-year-old boy back in 1990 and thus don't get the Dick Tracy movie reference, well, I'm sure there are many other Hollywood uh, or pop culture references that you could use uh, as the key image for today's episode. But suffice it to say, what we're talking about here is a type of intelligence gathering in which we are examining enemy communications for signs of what they are thinking, what they have done, and more importantly, perhaps most importantly, what they are going to do. Now, there are, of course, a number of different ways of collecting information, so you might think of SIGINT, or Signals Intelligence, whereby enemy communications are tapped or uh, somehow listened into so that we could get information about what the enemy is saying to themselves. But perhaps more importantly for today's episode, we can use the idea of OSINT, or Open Source Intelligence. And for those of you who don't know what open source intelligence is or what it's about, well, I invite you to go turn back to episode one of this podcast and listen to the opening few minutes where I try to explain what that is. But suffice it to say that open source intelligence is the idea that we can collect um, the vast majority of the data that we need to collect about our enemy through completely open sources, things that are available freely to the public from newspapers to books to uh, TV programs. It's all out there in the open, and it's there for us to see. And in fact, if you talk to the intelligence services these days, they freely admit that the vast majority of their intelligence comes from open sources, that it is not all just James Bonds running around doing their spy thing like in the Hollywood movies, that in fact, intelligence work these days is very much about listening in to freely available lectures and reading books and uh, reading newspapers and other such things to try to collect the data through which they can piece together a true understanding of their enemy. 
So I guess the first thing that we have to address in today's episode is the question of who is the enemy and how do we listen into what they're saying? Well, I think the enemy broadly defined has been defined very many times on this podcast. And we've looked at certain members of the oligarchy who, well, wittingly or not, although I would imagine mostly wittingly, are working to construct the new world order, the new world order that they themselves describe as a new world order. Again, that's not a term that I or anyone uh, doing this work has invented. It's something that they use quite openly. So we might look at people who use the term new world order to describe the one world government that they want to bring about, such as, of course, George H.W. Bush or uh, Big New Brzezinski or George Soros or Bilderberger Charlie Rose or all of those types of people who we've featured on this podcast many times. And uh, we can start by taking a look at what they are saying to each other and to, to the world in general through the speeches that they give openly and in the various uh, publications that they put out. This is not, in fact, really rocket science. In fact, it's, it's actually quite simple to do. In fact, it's so simple to do that most people don't bother to do it because I think there is the common conception that finding out what the elite are trying to do or the direction they want to take our world is like solving some puzzle with a decoder ring from a Cracker Jack box. And it's, uh, it's, it's, some people get into that. But in fact, it's actually much more simple than that. And we can take a look at what they are saying openly and without reservation and freely to the public in order to find out what is happening and what is likely to happen. And when you start to do that, you can uncover some pretty surprising things and sometimes some very uplifting things. As, for example, when a member of the oligarchy, or at least a puppet front politician for the ruling oligarchy, comes out and admits that we are winning the information war. The U.S. is losing an information war to alternative media outlets, including RT. That's the message from Hillary Clinton to Congress members who are questioning the State Department's $47 billion budget request for next year. And as RT's Ghani Chichikian reports, the U.S. Secretary of State says Washington needs to step up its propaganda efforts. Hillary Clinton was defending her department budget in Congress. She says a major reason the State Department needs money is because the U.S. is losing the information war. And among those media who are winning that war, Hillary Clinton named RT. I'll be very blunt in my assessment. Al Jazeera is winning. The Chinese have opened up a global English language and multi-language television network. The Russians have opened up an English language network. I've seen it in a few countries, and it's quite uh, instructive. Mrs. Clinton says uh, she's leading an effort to spread U.S. propaganda through new media, with Twitter feeds in Arabic and Farsi. But on global stage, the U.S. trails when it comes to television. She basically said the U.S. should step up propaganda efforts and get back, quote, in the game of doing, uh, quote, what we do best. Here is more. During the Cold War, we did a great job in getting America's message out. After the Berlin Wall fell, we said, okay, fine, enough of that. You know, we've done it, we're done. Um, and unfortunately, we are paying a big price for it. And our, our private media cannot fill that gap. In fact, our private media, particularly cultural programming, often works at counter purposes to what we truly are as Americans and what our values are. I remember having an Afghan general tell me that uh, the only thing he thought about Americans is that all the men wrestled and the women walked around in bikinis because the only TV he ever saw was Baywatch and worldwide wrestling. Aw, poor Hillary Clinton lamenting the days of Cold War propaganda when the U.S. could just brazenly assert its position and have vast masses of the public believing it wholesale. Well, we are certainly no longer in the old media paradigm of the 1950s or even the 60s or 70s or 80s or even the 90s. We are definitely in a 21st century new media paradigm that is utterly blowing away the old systems of control over the flow of information. And we can definitely see a lot of the ruling oligarchy in panic mode and wringing their hands about their inability to get their propaganda catapulted out to the public the way they used to. So there we have Hillary Clinton lamenting the state of current cultural programming, a very interesting term in and of itself, isn't it? And also the uh, the rise of media outlets such as, well, RT and Al Jazeera, and of course, people who 
follow my website at CorbettReport.com will know that I myself am frequently a guest on RT, uh, giving my own interpretation of news stories as they arise. And I certainly hope that people understand that RT and Al Jazeera is, in fact, as Hillary Clinton states, very much putting out a certain angle and putting out a certain message of their own. And it would be naive to think that they are simply bastions of truth and free speech. And some example, some indication of that might come from the on-air section of the RT website, which just simply asserts that this channel is government-funded, but shapes its editorial policy free from political and commercial influence. So I will let you check that out. Uh, I think RT is very much on the forefront of bringing truthful information about events happening in America and around the world, but I would very much question their motives for being the alternative voice against the American government and who is really behind that and funding it. So, So I'm well aware that they have their own agenda, but I'm happy to go on RT to reach out to many people, and I have never been told what to say on that prog- on their programs, and I've never been censored in what I've said at any point. So I will continue to speak out on that media platform as long as it's there for me to speak out on, or any other media platform, because I think any opportunity to engage the public, provided that it's free from censorship or editorial control, is valuable because we are, of course, in an information war, as Hillary Clinton herself admitted in exactly those terms. I mean, some people decry the idea of the info war and infowars.com and and other such concepts, but it is very much true. There is a war on for your mind. And as I try to stress over and over again in my work, that is perhaps the central war in which we find ourselves whether we like it that like it that way or not. So it's very much a war on consciousness, and we are in an information war. So at least there are alternative outlets like RT and Al Jazeera, and, well, to whatever extent that might be an alternative outlet, and I think they have some interesting connections as well. So I certainly don't trust any of these out- media outlets implicitly, but there are better and worse ways to get your information about what's happening in the world. So... At any rate, that is an interesting clip, isn't it? So Hillary Clinton lamenting the fact that U.S. State Department propaganda isn't getting out there in the ways that it used to. Well, along those lines, we have a similarly exciting and interesting clip from Zbigniew Brzezinski that's become rather infamous, I would say, in the last couple of years, of a speech that he gave in Montreal, addressing a Montreal branch of the Council on Foreign Relations. I'd like to get more information on that, in fact, because I did not know that there was Canadian branches of the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm not sure if that's that's simply been mislabeled. I'm not sure of the providence of this speech. But at any rate, certainly as Big New Brzezinski is in this clip, and he is lamenting the global political awakening quite famously now. As I say, it's uh, definitely made the rounds, and a lot of people are familiar with this clip. Although most people are familiar with his lamenting of the rise of the global political awakening, but not so familiar with the beginning part of this clip, in which he laments the fall of the Atlantic unipolar world and the fall of the uh, American empire as the sole arbiter of uh, of justice and truth and etc. in the world, and the rise of the multipolar world. Although one has to wonder about perhaps crocodile tears in this. At any rate, let's listen to Zbigniew Brzezinski fearing the global political awakening. Let me begin by making just a thumbnail definition of the geopolitical context in which we all find ourselves, including America. And in my perspective, that geopolitical context is very much defined by new by two new global realities. The first is that global political leadership, by which I mean the role of certain leading powers in the world, has now become much more diversified, unlike what it was until relatively recently. Relatively recently still, the world was dominated by the Atlantic world as it had been for many centuries. It no longer is. Today, the rise of the Far East has created a new, but much more differentiated global leadership. One which, in a nutshell, involves, if one can hazard, an arbitrary list of the primary players in the world scene, the United States, clearly, maybe next to it, but maybe the European Union, 
I say maybe because it is not yet a political entity, certainly increasingly so, and visibly so, China, Russia, mainly in one respect only, because it is a nuclear power co-equal to the United States, but otherwise very deficient in all of the major indices of what constitutes global power. Behind Russia, perhaps individually, but to a much lesser extent, Germany, France, Great Britain, Japan, certainly, although it does not have a politically assertive posture, India is rising. And then in the background of that, we have the new entity of G20, a much more diversified global leadership, lacking internal unity, with many of its members in bilateral antagonisms. That makes the context much more complicated. The other major change in international affairs is that for the first time in all of human history, mankind is politically awakened. That's a total new reality. Total new reality. It has not been so for most of human history until the last 100 years. And in the course of the last 100 years, the whole world has become politically awakened. And no matter where you go, politics is a matter of social engagement. And most people know what is generally going on, generally going on in the world, and are consciously aware of global iniquities, inequalities, lack of respect, exploitation. Mankind is now politically awakened and stirring. The combination of the two, a diversified global leadership, politically awakened masses, makes a much more difficult context for any major power, including currently the leading world power, the United States. Now, as I mentioned before that clip, I think there may be some degree of crocodile tears in that message because we know that people like Zbigniew Brzezinski and Kissinger and all of those of that ilk, that type of imperial legate who's running around one step behind the scenes of the political puppet frontmen who are put out front for uh, for us to throw our rotten tomatoes at, at when their act gets stale. Well, these imperial legates like uh, the Brzezinski's and Kissinger's, etc., who run around and do this strategic thinking behind the scenes to direct the political puppets are, uh, well, they're certainly and quite obviously and openly working towards a type of, well, one world order of some sort or other. And they may or may not say openly that they think that America will be the driving force of that one world order, although people like Soros go around saying it's going to be China. So so to what extent uh, Brzezinski is really lamenting the idea that there was the multipolar world uh, that's coming to an end, and to what extent he's celebrating that as the triumph of the globalization which him and his ilk are really trying to bring about, well, I'll leave that for you to decide. And there is, of course, always the caveat with these open source uh, intelligence gatherings that well, we we know that these are going out to the public, so we have to wonder to what extent there are multiple layers of messages being put out by these people. But I will leave that for you to ponder a little bit, and we will come back to that that idea a little bit later in today's episode. But for now, let's just simply uh, take in and, and take the positive from that, that definitely Brzezinski is uh, lamenting the idea that there is a globally politically engaged and uh, awakening uh, political actors around the globe and that the citizenry is becoming politically active in a way that wouldn't have been feasible in any previous time in human history as the free flow of information across the internet mobilizes and and informs more and more people about their true political condition and busts through all the phony paradigms of left and right and other such political manipulation techniques that the ruling oligarchs and social engineers have put in our way to try to deflect us onto issues of no significance. So again, there is something positive to be taken from that, and once again the message comes out that the global elite are panicking to a certain extent, and are uh, very much aware that they are losing the information war. So don't buy into the enemy propaganda that resistance is futile and that there's nothing you can do and everything is controlled. Ha ha ha. No, I think very much we can see from clips like these that there is some hand wringing going on at some elite levels about our ability to truly transform their media paradigm. And we are doing that. And that's what things like the Corbett Report are dedicated to doing. So let's continue to do it.
But let's move on to another area entirely of uh, open source intelligence about the enemy communications. And this time we're going to listen to uh, a, a clip of a speech that I cannot stress highly enough that you have to listen to in its entirety. I even contemplated the idea of putting the entire speech in today's episode, but I don't think a three and a half hour episode would probably be uh, would be able to keep everyone's attention. So I will simply include the link, as always, to this speech and allow you to check it out for yourself. But uh, it is truly impossible, really, to to just take one clip of this speech and and really encapsulate what it's about. Well, what am I referring to? It is called The Pentagon's New Map. And it's a speech that I've read about numerous times and thought I knew what it was about, uh, simply from those synopses that I had read. But luckily, thankfully, there have been several uh, listeners in the last few months that have been sending me links to this and saying that I have to watch it or rewatch it. And I'm glad that they did do that, and I'm glad that I did take the time to uh, to listen to this entire lecture, this two-and-a-half-hour lecture, because it is riveting, absolutely riveting stuff, and it, it shows very much what they, uh, the elite are thinking at a very high level and the strategies and things that they are working on in order to usher in, well, a new American century, question mark. But uh, that's what they're openly proclaiming anyway. So the Pentagon's new map is basically a lecture that uh, was developed by a man named Thomas Barnett, who at the time was a chief researcher for the Naval War College. And in the early part of the last decade, from 2001 to 2003, he was working in uh, the Department of Defense in uh, something called the Office of Force Transformation. And we'll come back to a little bit more about what that is and and how that was set up and what what this was all about. But first, let me play the opening of this speech, because really, as I say, no, no brief clip from this speech will encapsulate the entire the entirety of the speech but the opening uh, where thomas barnett explains a little bit about what this this is all about this this speech that he's about to deliver and the long and short of it is that this is uh, a, a speech that he's worked up about the idea of new rule sets he was in something called the new rule sets project looking at ways that rule sets have been changed by various events and how it is currently we're in an age of transformation of rule sets and how this is really directing uh, the way that the pentagon is perceiving the world and of course trying to manipulate that world again a fascinating speech so let's just listen to the beginning of thomas barnett talking about the beginning of the new rule sets project I like to describe the brief and this presentation as the product of about a six-year conversation with Art Sombrowski, in addition to a long mentoring relationship um, I've had or enjoyed uh, with Hank Gaffney at the Center for Naval Analyses and a similar relationship with uh, retired four-star Admiral Bud Flanagan, uh, recently of Cantor Fitzgerald. The way I like to describe the conversation with Art is to note that we came to the War College at roughly the same time, summer 1998. He had a list of things he wanted us to study. At the top of that list, obviously, net-centric warfare. At that point, more glimmer in his eye than the dogma it has become throughout the Pentagon. At the bottom of that list was a very odd subject. The potential for the year 2000 problem to serve as a security situation around the planet. As the most recent hire and the professor with the least standing, I was given that project. It turned out to be the most fascinating project I'd ever done. It was a grand exploration of how we think about instability and crisis in this interconnected world. And that's really how Art Sobrowski saw it. He saw it as a heuristic opportunity an opportunity for teaching and learning. Because he knew there'd be unprecedented discussions between the Defense Department and the rest of the U.S. government, between the government and the private sector, and between America and the world. So we created a project, and we called it the Year 2000 International Security Dimension Project. We came up with a series of scenarios, both good and bad. Our worst case scenario, was pretty fantastic. Got us a lot of interesting press, 
I was dubbed the Nostradamus of the Navy. Jack Anderson, the muckraking journalist, wrote an expose on my secretly training the U.S. government and the Marine Corps to take over society in the event of chaos on January 1st. And he had pictures. <laughs> my wife said, if you can do all that from your desk at Newport, why can't you take out the garbage on Tuesdays like I asked? <laughs> Our worst case scenario. Pretty fantastic. Wall Street shut down for a week. Air travel in the United States shut down for about 10 days. A surge in hate crimes against ethnic groups identified as part of the problem. A surge in gun buying. Islanding of certain services, especially insurance. Breakdowns in just-in-time supply chains. A terrible description of January 1, 2000. A very prescient description, September 12, 2001. It wasn't because we were predicting anything. I was scheduled to be on the 105th floor of the World Trade Center two weeks to the day after 9-11. So obviously we weren't predicting the trigger. But we had thought long and hard about the horizontal scenarios that would emerge from that vertical shock. Now we were approached by Cantor Fitzgerald in the midst of this workshop series. They had done a series of workshops with the War College in the early 1990s, looked at a war in the Persian Gulf, looked at a financial crisis beginning in Southeast Asia, looked at a terrorist strike downtown Manhattan. So we were pretty impressed with their thinking ahead capabilities. They said, we think we've seen this Y2K beast before. We said, really, what did it look like? They said, we think we saw it in the Asian flu. And we said, boy, that does not compute. We're talking about a software failure. You're talking about a financial panic. The way I translated what they said to me next was essentially, we like to look at the world in terms of rule sets. What's a rule set? Hockey has a rule set. American football has a rule set. The U.S. legal system has a rule set. The U.S. military has a rule set. You walk into these venues, you know what the rules are, basically. And their argument for the 1990s, which they said was similar to the 1920s, was that rule sets were out of whack. But in the process of expanding the global economy so dramatically across the 80s and 90s, economic rule sets raced ahead of political rule sets. And technolo technological rule sets, and connectivity in general, raced ahead of security rule sets. In effect, we wired up much faster than we had the ability to keep pace with in terms of the political and security rule sets. And their fear with Y2K was that it would be something cataclysmic and that it would crystallize our understanding of those rule sets out of whack and that there would be a period of tremendous rule set catch up at that point. We do a workshop with Cantor Fitzgerald, Windows on the World, 107th floor, World Trade Center 1, 1999. They like it so much, they say let's do a series on globalization itself. We'll call it the New Rule Sets Project. We're going to focus on developing Asia. Because in their mind, the integration of roughly half the world's population since 1980 is changing rule sets all over the planet. Best place to catch it, frankly, Wall Street Journal. And you have to extrapolate back in the direction of the New York Times and security and back in the direction of the Washington Post and politics, which frankly is the slowest of the three in terms of dealing with change. So we did a series of workshops on developing Asia. One was on energy, one was on foreign direct investment, one was on environmental damage. Everything I read in the Wall Street Journal today, I heard about from Wall Street about five, six years ago. So again, I find their intelligence networks very impressive. This project gets shot out from under us somewhat literally, on 9-11. Cantor loses between 650 and 700 people. At that point, I'm footloose and fancy free. Art Zabrowski is just retired as a three-star, goes to work for Secretary Rumsfeld as his transformation guru, asked me to come work for him. I said, my wife told me I could marry my divorce attorney and move back to Washington any time I damn well pleased. He said, don't worry, I'm the father of net-centric warfare. Here's a cell phone, it's called Southwest to BWI. And about 200 flight credits later, 
this briefing exists. What Art asked me to do in this briefing was to give him a larger context, to elevate the discussion of transformation beyond the whack list, as in what gets cut. As he likes to tell people, America doesn't have a grand strategy. I needed one for my job, so I outsourced the function to Barnett. And that's what this brief became. Audacious beyond belief. Purposely so, though. Audacious, certainly, but, well, come on, James. Thomas Barnett seems like an amiable enough fellow. Certainly he seems to know what he's talking about, and there doesn't seem to be anything particularly untoward about this Pentagon project, is there? Why on earth would he be in an episode of the Corbett Report called Listening to the Enemy? Isn't that a bit strong? Well, in order to understand a little bit better where that lecture is coming from and where it eventually goes, and once again, let me exhort you to go and listen to the entire lecture because it really does contain numerous gems which just cannot be encapsulated here. But in order to understand that lecture a little bit better, we have to pick up on what he said about its origins and its origins in conversations with a man named Art Sabrowski. So let's hop on over to historycommons.org and the 9-11 terror timeline, which, by the way, is, once again, I will urge listeners out there to go and use as an incredible resource on so many different things. And anyone who appreciated my recent video on The Last Word on Osama bin Laden has History Commons to thank for so much of that research, as you will see in uh, the links that were given in the, the transcript for that video. So, once again, History Commons is an excellent place to go. And if you go there and type the name Art Sabrowski, C-E-B-R-O-W-S-K-I, into the historycommons.org search, You'll find an entry from the October 29th, 2001 entry on the timeline. And on that date, Rumsfeld establishes Office of Force Transformation. And the Office of For Force Transformation, you'll find out, is something that was established by and run by Rumsfeld, supposedly as part of President Bush's broad mandate to transform the Department of Defense, which came about, obviously, in the wake of 9-11. And uh, it turns out that, yes, this is part of what uh, Rumsfeld, as a signatory to PNAC, had already been talking about uh, one year before 9-11 in September 2000 in the, art, in the now infamous uh, Rebuilding America's Defenses document, again released in September 2000, including the signatories of the Project for a New American Century, including Rumsfeld and Cheney and many, many other insider neocons who, of course, famously wrote th that they would need uh, to transform U.S. forces to exploit the revolution in military affairs. But, of course, such a process, barring some sort of uh, revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. And that was written one year before the new Pearl Harbor arrived in the form of 9-11 under the administration of Cheney and the neocons. Well, interesting. Well, of course, I think my listeners will know by now that the that is obviously one piece of the puzzle of 9-11. And it is interesting to see that the exact thing that they were talking about in that Rebuilding America's Defenses came about after 9-11. Wow, imagine that. So they used that event to get exactly what they wanted. Well, who would have thought that would ever happen? So yes, this entire idea of new rule sets and the fact that as Barnett goes on to say quite explicitly in that lecture that 9-11 was the exact catalyzing event that the American empire needs in order to suddenly go to start formalizing these new rule sets. Well, again, this is all quite circular thinking because it was already established in September 2000. So in some ways, we can see this Pentagon's new map lecture as really just confirming once again from another uh, insider source of the existence of the incredible um, fortune for the ruling elite of events like 9-11, because as listeners to the previous episode of this podcast on problem reaction solution will know, of course, it is these problems which garner the types of reactions through which the these people can implement the solutions, which they have often written about long in advance. 
So once again, there is a great predictive power in listening to the enemy, because often the enemy is telling you exactly what they are going to do, and then they do it, and then it all happens the way they said it was going to happen, and we're supposed to act surprised, or we're supposed to applaud people like Thomas Barnett who come along in the aftermath and tell us how it was done. Well, not really. So let's turn from that sort of retroactive confirmation to what the elite had already told us towards looking at how we can use this information to predict what's coming. So let's look at an example, a very specific example, of how one could could have known what was coming if one had been paying attention to the right sources ahead of time. And we'll switch to an enemy organization that uh, was identified as such in last week's episode on KAL 007 by Congressman Larry McDonald, and of course has been mentioned many, many times on this podcast in the past. I'm talking, of course, of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the CFR as it's popularly known, and uh, it's not very difficult to find out what the uh, the upper crust of the CFR are thinking or th- talking about because they're, again, quite open. It's absolutely open to the public. So they have a, a journal that they publish, the Foreign Affairs Journal, which you could subscribe to or uh, give your hard-earned dollars, toilet paper, over to the Council on Foreign Affairs, uh, Council on Foreign Relations, sorry, to read their their propaganda rag, but it is important to actually read things like this because, again, they are telling you what's coming. So, for example, the May-June 2011 issue of Foreign Affairs is talking about the New Arab Revolt. What just happened? Why no one saw it coming? What it means? What comes next? What comes next being the key phrase from an organization which has so many people in so many positions of power to implement the very things that they're talking about. So again, listening to the enemy has predictive power. And let's look at an example of how this actually has worked in the past. And for that, we're going to turn to an episode of the Peace Revolution podcast. Episode 26 of that podcast, Exposing the Folly of an American Theater of the Absurd, was specifically about the unfolding Osama bin Laden death hoax and all of the implications of that. And part of that episode is an interview by James Evan Pilato of Richard Grove of TragedyandHope.com. And this is also available uh, as part of an, uh, a Media Monarchy episode. So I'll put in links to both of those in the documentation section for today's episode. But let's listen to a part of the conversation where Richard Grove is describing a Foreign Affairs Council on Foreign Relations journal from 1998 that had surprisingly predictive uh, abilities when talking about what was coming in the very near future. If we go into the 90s, there's a very interesting document from 1998 published by the Council on Foreign Relations in the form of their Foreign Affairs Journal. Uh, It's from November, December 1998. And one of the articles is by Bernard Lewis, who explains Osama bin Laden. So I thought that'd be interesting. So uh, Bernard Lewis's article is called Licensed to Kill, and it specifically names and promotes Osama bin Laden as this up-and-coming terrorist and how he has this uh, declaration of the World Islamic Front for Jihad against the Jews and the Crusaders, end quote, right? So it's a big propaganda piece, and if you look up Bernard Lewis and you see what his role has been in his life, so do the grammar of Bernard Lewis, see where he was educated, see who created the Princeton School where he was educated, And then you can start to see it's the same school that brought us people like uh, Woodrow Wilson and the Ph.D. system from Prussia. And so when you understand who the authors of these documents are in 1998, scaring us about Osama bin Laden, then you can start to see the common membership of these authors to clubs, one of which being the Council on Foreign Relations. The second article is by two notorious characters, John Deutsch who was uh, ex-MIT and ex-CIA, uh, well, actually, he was current CIA at the time, Director of Intelligence, and he also had connections to banks that were involved with 9-11 insider trading. The other article, uh, the other author of the article is Philip Zalikow, who at that time had been a co-author with Condoleezza Rice on a book about Germany's rebuilding after World War II, and after re- writing this article a few years later, he became the executive director of the 9-11 Commission. Now, If you uh, let me browse through this article, and I'm just going to read words that I've highlighted, it'll kind of give you an idea of what they're trying to create between these two articles. The first one specifically mentioning Osama bin Laden and that he's out to get the Jews, 
quote unquote. That's that's the quote that they're quoting Bin Laden, right? That he has this declaration against the Jews and the the colonists. In this article on catastrophic terrorism by Deutsch and Zelikow, they talk about quote weapons of mass destruction, the legacy of Hollywood and Tom Clancy and nightmarish scenarios, the World Trade Center. Five lines below that, like Pearl Harbor, this event would divide our past and future into a before and after. On the next page, oh, by the way, uh, Ashton Carter is the third author on the article. He's from the Ford Foundation. John Deutsch is an MIT professor and director of Central Intelligence and deputy director of defense. Philip Zelikow is a former member of the National Security Staff and also the co-author on that Condoleezza Rice book. Folks may also remember John Deutsch, I believe, squirming under the confrontation and Mike accusations Rupert. of Mike Rupert. Right, right. And so, um, let's see, let's go another couple pages into the article, because it's, it's quite a verbose article. I wouldn't attempt to summarize it. It does talk about the RAND Corporation and their participation in this. Again, uses the term weapons of mass destruction, and curiously mentions the Federal Emergency Management Agency would organize consequence management under a federal response plan, this present structure is adequate for ordinary terrorist threats or attacks or even small scares involving weapons of mass destruction. Well, clearly, FEMA was even there the day before 9-11 and they couldn't do anything about it. So I'm going to, you know, we could talk a whole episode about that paragraph. Mm -hmm. Again, mentions crisis management for catastrophic terrorism. Well, what is L. Paul Bremer's job at Marsha McLennan? Oh, he, right. He was risk management, crisis management. That's ironic because his company gets taken down in 9-11 and then he get, he becomes the new dictator over Iraq after they get rid of Iraqi law and before they instill U.S. law. He's there in a gray zone of just piracy where there's hundreds of billions of dollars that went missing. That's the pallets of cash floating around there? Right. L. Yeah. Paul Bremer, he came from Marsha McLennan. He was a CEO of risk management. So I'm just going to go to the last paragraph in this article called Overcoming Disbelief. Catastrophic terrorism poses an eminent threat to America's future, but the United States can fight back only if it sets the right goals. In 1940 and 1941, the U.S. government pondered what kind of forces it would need to wage a global war. The answers went on far beyond the imagination of the wry smiles and shaking heads in Washington offices greeted the planning papers as they made their rounds. The Cold War saw similar patterns of disbelief. The notion of an intelligence system founded on photographic surveillance from the upper atmosphere or outer space seemed outrageously far-fetched in 1954 when the U-2 program was born. The films and cameras alone seemed an overwhelming hurdle. A few years later, U-2s were flying. Six, six years later, satellites were in place. Similar stories could be told about the remarkable history of intercontinental missile guidance and how we shared it with the Soviets or the fast deployment of more than half a million troops and thousands of armored vehicles of the Persian Gulf in 1991 and 1992. Now, the context of this is, what would it take to wage a global war? And the last sentence is, America can meet new challenges, but first, it must imagine success. Only then it, can it organize itself and attain it. And so the whole article is saying, if you guys want this, you're going to have to organize a good story and attain it, like Pearl Harbor, using the World Trade Center. And, oh, there's, you know, three stories before. There's this guy, Osama bin Laden, it says licensed to kill because he has a declaration against the Jews and Crusaders. So it seems like a perfect story. This is 1998. That and, they publi and they publish it. And that it's, it's, in a way, it's as giving the pieces. It's like, here are all these parts. Here's, here's bin Laden. Here's crisis management. Here's WMD. Here's the World Trade Center. Here's... Anti-Semites. Here's. By the how, way, that's that's, that's very interesting together. because when I looked up Bernard Lewis, he's actually written on anti-Semitism I and mean, the Holocaust and things like this, and he's written and done so in a propagandized manner, as was his training by the roundtable people. The same people that created Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study are the same roundtable people that control Oxford through All Souls College. This is all Cecil Rhodes' legacy. And it's still incarnate in the form of the De Beers Diamond Cartel, which basically runs MI6 and CIA and Mossad. Well, we will leave that fascinating conversation on that fascinating note, but suffice it to say there's no doubt that we are indeed talking about the enemy, as in people who are very much committed to the establishment of the One World Order,
and uh, very much uh, communicating what they know and telegraphing it in a way so that readers of foreign affairs back in, to, in 1998 would have had some inkling or some preparation for what was coming. And there's uh, certainly at least two senses in which that type of telegraphing of intentions can work, and it depends on the audience for that type of telegraphing, so that the general public can just become start becoming uh, steeped in the terror hysteria, which was to become obviously the dominant theme of the first decade of this century, so that uh, the public could be introduced to the boogeyman, as it were, the boogeyman who was just retired at the beginning of this month. Well, uh, so from that perspective, aimed at the general population, it's just another form of propaganda. But I guess for people in the know, people who do understand that what's coming out of the Foreign Affairs Journal is obviously going to be insider-type information, well, they can start reading between the lines and fi fitting together some of the puzzle pieces for themselves. Because let's be clear, I don't believe that what we are fighting per se here is an enemy organization that is monolithic or is comprised of people who themselves completely know every aspect of what's going on. In fact, I think it's quite clear that even the majority of people within organizations, that large organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations, probably don't really have a clue, an inkling about the entirety, this, the j broad scope of what's going on, and may in fa fact themselves even be ignorant of the history and real foundations of their own institutions. And again, I think even groups like Bilderberg, even though they are much smaller and therefore of necessity somewhat more elite, certainly the people who are invited there just uh, occasionally or just uh, on a one-off basis are not really expected to be part of the inner circle of Bilderberg and thus probably themselves have no real inkling of the extent to, what, uh, to which Bilderberg is working and working through various sources and uh, uh, seats of power in order to implement their agenda, or even what that agenda is. Certainly things like Bilderberg are run by a steering committee, which is the core nucleus of the group, and which alone, I imagine, truly understands what they are doing and how they are implementing it. So again, there's secrecy within secrecy, circles within circles, as G. Edward Griffin memorably put it in a previous episode of this podcast. And there's that aspect to look at. So again, we have different types of propaganda, or sometimes it's the same piece of propaganda aimed at different substrata of the population simultaneously. So we have to parse through that when we're taking a look at these types of documents. And again, Council on Foreign Relations members are, are maybe a good place to start when trying to decode what the enemy is thinking and planning to do next. So on that note, let's turn to another Council on Foreign Relations insider. And this is Farid Zakaria, who, well, for his insider bona fide, I will include a link to the Council on Foreign Relations at CFR.org, where you can read their own biography of Farid Zakaria, editor, Newsweek International, because he uh, is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a prominent media personality. And he also serves on the boards of Yale University, the Trilateral Commission, and Shakespeare and Company. Well, make of that what you will, but at any rate, there's Farid Zakaria in a nutshell, and he now hosts a CNN show called Farid Zakaria GPS, and you can get the podcast downloaded for free uh, through iTunes or your podcatcher of choice, and again, it's a good way to keep up on enemy transmissions, and oh, by the way, did I mention Farid Zakaria just recently announced that, oh, he tends to advise Obama on a personal basis. I read something in the paper this week, a couple days ago, that actually made me, you know, brought a smile to my face. It said, the President of the United States calls you for wisdom and advice about issues around the world. So first, when he calls you, what does he say? Hi, Barack, uh, <laughs> calling for Fareed. What, what, what does he do? Mostly it's been it's been face-to-face -face meetings. Right. Uh, you know, it's usually organized by Tom Donnellan, the National right. Security Advisor. Uh, what I'm struck by, though, honestly, Ali, is, is how much time he's spending thinking about the issues of the Arab Spring, particularly the issues of Egypt. Uh, how you know how to make Egypt go right? What what you know? What is the what are the mechanisms that the United States has to help the moderates and liberals? Uh, it's been a very thoughtful conversation. It, you know, we'll oh, see where it goes. I'm not going to ask you what you have said to the president, but it makes my heart warm that the president is calling you for wisdom and advice. Although, to be fair to Fareed, he did say on his CNN blog uh, after this story became viral that uh, his the characterization of him as an advisor to President Obama is inaccurate because over the last few months he's had a couple of 
conversations off the record telling Obama what to do. I added the last, obviously, but uh, again, this is the type of thing that if it was in another situation with another type of person talking to another political insider, well, if they wanted that exposed and made into a scandal, it would become one and it would be on the front page of every mainstream news outlet. But of course, they don't want this one made into a scandal because the CFR are always advising and telling presidents what to do. So I, this, there's nothing to report here, I guess. Well... At any rate, there is Fareed Zakaria. So it is valuable to take a, a look at the propaganda that he is pushing on his show because, again, this is a very important for understanding what is going to happen next. And in order to do uh, to take a look at some examples of that, why don't we turn to a recent episode of his GPS, the Bin Laden death episode that was released on May 8th, 2011, and featured some very interesting guests. And one of them was... Michael Hayden. This is how Fareed Zakaria introduced Michael Hayden. So what is the story behind bin Laden's death? What are the consequences? Joining me now is one of America's great spy masters, Michael Hayden. Hayden was director of the National Security Agency on 9-11 and later was the head of the CIA. He's worked under Presidents Clinton, Bush and Obama. Oh, yes, the head of the NSA on 9-11. And for people with a very good memory or people who do check my sources and saw in my recent Last Word on Osama bin Laden video, the link back to that fascinating Milt Bearden interview that took place on the evening of 9-12 slash 9-13 between Dan Rather and Milt Bearden, well, you would you would have seen that that was a link back to a, the invaluable September 11th television archive, which I would really hope if there are people with the ability to do so, please go and just download as many of those files as you can, because that is a valuable, valuable treasure trove of information that very few people even know exists. But there are news feeds from ABC, ABC, CBS, CNN, all of those uh, major news outlets from 9-11, 9-12, 9-13, and all of those original broadcasts are, are held there. So that's incredibly valuable information that could disappear at any time. So please, people, go out there and back it up. But at any rate, if you go to that uh, clip, that, that hour segment that I included as the link back to that Milt Bearden interview, you'll see earlier in that they had a little fascinating little interview piece with Michael Hayden, head of the NSA, that, that they were talking about uh, Osama bin Laden and why it was so incredibly difficult to track him down. Well, uh, Michael Hayden's laughable, ridiculous response is essentially that because bin Laden was using uh, a satellite phone that he procured through his network in America, well, the NSA just can't track that because they're, they're designed to, to look at foreign devices, but certainly not American devices. Insert uproarious laughter here because we obviously know that the NSA can uh, not only can but has been and, and explicitly forces it, the companies to make all of their devices listenable and and backdoorable by the NSA. I mean, we know that so so thoroughly now that to see that kind of propaganda coming out on nine twelve two thousand one. Well, uh, retroactively, you can laugh, I suppose, but laugh in order not to scream in rage. Um, but we all know how that story turned out and how untrackable bin Laden really was until finally the Navy SEALs got him just in time. Oh, it's it's so wonderful. Well, that's uh, Michael Hayden. And uh, what did he have to say on the Zakaria program about bin Laden's recent death and the ramifications of the, f the killing of the boogeyman in Abbottabad? So you are very well acquainted with the relationship between the CIA and the ISI. You worked at uh, the Pakistani intelligence agency. Uh, given all you know, uh, is, it, is it plausible to you that Osama bin Laden was living in a fortified uh, uh, house, eight times the size of every other house in the, re in the area, with no phone lines, uh, all kinds of suspicious activity, uh, and that nobody in the Pakistani military knew, even though this was happening one mile from their West Point, their Sandhurst. Right. Uh, Fareed, let me give you a professional and a, and a personal answer. At the professional level, and, and, and frankly, this is the best answer I'm going to give you, we just have to let the facts take us where they will. And now that we've got this trove of documents and electronic media uh, from this particular building, uh, some of those facts may be in that, that mountain of data. On a personal level, it, it, it really does tug at credulity 
to, to think this could go on without someone, and, and, and by no means am I accusing anyone particularly, particularly at the highest levels of the Pakistani government, but it's hard to believe this could happen without someone suspecting at least what was going on there. I mean, what did the neighbors think? Well, what was the word on the street? What did the local police chief believe? Those kinds of things, uh, I think, in this case, we have a right to know. In this case, the burden of proof is on the Pakistanis. Now, finally, General, give us a sense of the consequences. So you talked about the treasure trove of documents. Um, what do you see as the, as the most likely consequence of Osama bin Laden's death? There, there are two or three things that are, that are happening, Fareed. One is the treasure trove of documents. And, and frankly, I, I can't remember the last time we did what's called SSE, sensitive site exploitation against the leading al-Qaeda figure. It's been years, and so this will be very, very important. Uh, the second thing is al-Qaeda now has to go through a succession crisis. Uh, the word is out that they've got a succession plan. It's Ayman al-Zawahiri, the number two, but no plan survives contact with reality the way it was originally developed. So I'm going to enjoy watching how, how al-Qaeda deals with this. And then finally, Fareed, and this is really important, any member of Al-Qaeda, particularly prospective members of Al-Qaeda, have to remember this mission. They're going to think about what happened here. That these Americans have great reach, have great precision, and a very long memory. That's a very powerful thing in the kind of war in which we're engaged. Well, there really, in a nutshell, are all of the key storylines that the CFR and the well-connected elite of the CIA and NSA and other such agencies would like you to take away from the bin Laden death hoax narrative. And in reverse order, we have the admission that this extrajudicial assassination, and which is completely in contravention to every international, every tenant of international law and every tenant of... of common sense that in a country cannot just go and invade the sovereign territory of another country to go and kill someone that they say without providing any evidence is guilty of a crime. Well, uh, obviously that was completely ridiculous on its face, but is justified in the minds of the dumbed down public because, well, this is the man responsible for 9-11. Therefore, anything is, is okay when it comes to getting him. And it, this definitely was a message to people who are aware of what an incredible breach of all standards of international law that is, what an incredible atrocity really it was. Regardless of who it was or in what circumstances, uh, the extrajudicial assassination in crossing international borders is very much an international war crime. But we know who the war criminals are, and we know that they, and under the present system, will never come to justice. And I think that's the message that was being sent, and I'm not sure it was being sent to members or would-be members of Al-Qaeda so much as really just the average population, people who are actually aware of what's really going on in the war and terror narrative. We also have Mr. Hayden bringing up the incredible treasure trove of Al-Qaeda documents that have been snuck out of the Abbottabad compound of the Al-Qaeda Al-Qaeda boogeyman. And uh, it's, well, what needs to be said about this story other than what has already been said by people like Paul Joseph Watson in his story from May 14th, 2011, Bin Laden's one million page cache will be used to legitimize official 9-11 fable. And I would add to that what many other analysts have added, that basically this mythical treasure trove of documents from bin Laden's compound will be able to justify just about anything that the elite mouthpieces want you to hear about and want you to understand about this al Qaeda threat. Basically, any time there's anything they want you to be scared of, they'll just bring out a supposed document from this supposed treasure trove of information that, of course, we will never have access to, where they say that al-Qaeda is or was planning such and such a thing. Therefore, we have to do such and such a thing. And we've already seen that starting to be implemented with the no-ride lists that have been proposed for trains in the United States because apparently al Qaeda was planning some sort of uh, event on an al-Qaeda uh, or on an Amtrak train track somewhere in the U.S., somewhere around 9-11-2011. So because of this aspirational plan, which they admit had no basis in reality, it was just an idea in one of these mythical documents that they've supposedly pulled out of their <clears throat> Abbottabad compound, well, that's going to be used to justify these no-ride lists, like the no-fly lists, which listeners to the Corporate Report will already know are being turned into no-buy lists. So 
the cycle of ridiculous justifications for overt tyranny continue, and it all, again, stems from this Bin Laden death hoax narrative. And then, of course, the, the first thing that was mentioned there is probably the most important in the near future, the geostrategic and geopolitical ramifications of all of this uh, Bin Laden death hoax, and that is the fact that he was found one kilometer away from Pakistan's equivalent of Sandhurst. And uh, the obvious implication is that he was being hid by the Pakistani military and ISI, and therefore there is going to be a massive ratcheting up in tensions between the two countries and a potential for the actual military extension of the Afghan war into Pakistan. And we already know that that's been going on for some time with the drone strikes, but now it could actually be formalized, and that's especially worrying because, as Webster Tarpley has been noting, China has recently issued an ultimatum to Washington, basically saying any attack on Pakistan would be construed as an attack on China. And as we've been going on in this podcast time and time again for months on end now, China is the billion-person elephant in the room. Much of what's going on geopolitically is really being aimed at or with China in mind at any rate. And the... uh, Chess pieces are being lined up for World War III, as we've talked about many times on this podcast, and this is just another, yet another indication that, again, can be garnered from the open source information that is freely available to the public and is being telegraphed to you by the elite power players, exactly in the same way that the same group of power players at the Council on Foreign Relations were telegraphing the War on Terror narrative back in 1998, as Richard Grove pointed out earlier. So, where does that all leave us? Well, certainly I hope by this point I have at least established the idea that there is very much value to be gained in taking a look at these types of insider publications and interviews and speeches and lectures and other such ways of finding out through open source methods what the elite insiders are thinking and talking about. There is very much predictive value in doing this, and I think we've demonstrated that from the 1998 example, and we can even apply that to what's happening right now, talking about the Bin Laden death hoax narrative and people like Michael Hayden, or you could continue watching that uh, Fareed Zagaria GPS episode, and later on he interviews uh, the U.S., uh, the Pakistani ambassador to the U.S. alongside Richard M. Haas. Oh yeah, Richard M. Haas, the head of the Council on Foreign Relations. Surprise, surprise. So, and you can watch Richard Haas basically saying to to Pakistan in general and to the ambassador in particular, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. And it's, uh, again, shaping up in a very, very obvious direction, and they're telegraphing their punches. So having said that, I think the utility of listening to the enemy has been well established in this episode, but now it's time for the caveat, and there is a major caveat with all of this, and that is to say that there are multiple layers to this propaganda, and obviously the same message is intended to be read by different audiences in different ways. So there is a, a double danger. One is that knowing that people are listening to what these types of people are saying and knowing that certain organizations like the CFR are now becoming known for being elite insider organizations that are working against the interests of, well, the United States, obviously, and similar organizations working against the national sovereignty of their own countries, respectively. Well, knowing that, then obviously, as we talked about earlier with Bug Bailey being a, perhaps a key image for today's episode, well, exactly as in the Dick Tracy movie, when Big Boy finds out that he's being tapped, he starts feeding false information to the Dick Tracy and his cohorts, and Tracy ultimately ends up in trouble because of it. So, once again, false information can be fed through the elite to the people who are listening to them if they know that we are listening. That's a bit of a meta-level analysis, but it is a caveat that needs to be kept in mind. And the other caveat is really that since there are multiple layers of propaganda going on in every conversation, it's not always so straightforward to understand exactly what the propaganda is aiming at or who the real players are or even how they're connected to each other behind the scenes. And without that information, without those key pieces of information, which sometimes we are simply not privy to, it's impossible to truly understand what a specific uh, context for an utterance is. So let's take a look at an example of that 
as we start to wrap up today's episode. And this comes from a May 9th edition of the Charlie Rose Show. And as listeners to this podcast will know by now, Bilderberg Charlie Rose is very much an enemy to listen to because as a Bilderberg attendee and someone who frequently interviews other Bilderberg attendees and other political insiders, well, his broadcast is very, very much a fascinating repository of information from elite mouthpieces and often talking with some candor because, again, the vast majority of the public doesn't really keep up with something like the Charlie Rose Show and lots of insider-type information can be garnered from it. Well, recently on the May 9th episode, they had a very interesting conversation with uh, Timothy Geithner, of course, the head of the Treasury and obviously the former head of the New York Federal Reserve, and uh, his counterpart in from China, Wang Qishan. A very interesting conversation, which was recorded in Washington on the occasion of Wang Qishan's visit, visit to the United States to meet with Geithner and to conduct talks on the merging of the Chinese and American co- economies as is has been going on for decades now. And this brings to a, the forefront something that is a key underlying tension in the idea that we are being set up for a World War III with China. And that is simply that people who are informed and people who have, for example, read my recent article about the idea of uh, China and World War III will know, well, China has been built up quite specifically by the elite who are now proclaiming that China is the big threat and seeming to line up a war with them. We know that Kissinger and Rockefeller were working behind the scenes to get Nixon to China, and all of that was set up, and we know that Clinton had transferred nuclear warfighting technology to the Chinese. Specifically, Clinton himself had approved the transfer of those technologies, and we know all of the ways in which the offshoring of American jobs to China was specifically and with forethought, with malice of forethought, planned out and conducted, and that we have that from insiders like James Goldsmith, uh, one of the Rothschild uh, European gentry set who turned ranks in the 90s and said, well, they're they're basically going to ruin the world economy. And he was exactly right. Well, surprise, surprise. I wonder how he knew that. And uh, all of this has been set up and it's, it seems that China has been built up by these elites. So is there truly a tension between them? Is there truly a war shaping up between them? Or is this another part of the political theater? Well, perhaps both. I mean, perhaps what we're witnessing is the struggle between what is not a monolithic conspiracy by any means. There are factions, there are rivals. I think different people in these different organizations have different levels of understanding of where they are and what's going to play out. So they are fighting for territory in some real sense, even as they are collaborating in other senses. So watching this interview with Geithner and Kishan is particularly interesting, I think. And there again, there are multiple layers of propaganda going on here and very interesting tensions going on within the interview itself. So let's listen to just a key excerpt from this uh, with the, of course, the proviso, as always, that the link to the entire conversation will be available in the documentation section of today's episode. You have said uh, that the thing that could get in the way of U.S.-Chinese relations is fear not so much a disagreement over specific policy. I think, you know, you, you see this risk of Americans concerned that China's rise will come at our expense. Right. And you see in China some concern that the objective of U.S. policy is to contain China's rise. Both those perceptions, I think, are false, uh, and they're, they, they pose risk to both of us. And I think part of what we have to do is try to demonstrate to the citizens of both countries that as we work to advance and protect and defend our interests vis-a-vis each other, uh, that we can do that and still find a way we can grow together. And that's the, I think it's going to be the great challenge of the coming decades for both these two countries. And that's why we're investing so much time and effort into make, trying to make sure that we understand China's interests, its intentions, their values and traditions, and ask them to do the same for the United States, because that will help us avoid the kind of miscalculations that would raise the odds of future tension. Secretary Geithner said what uh, Secretary Kissinger has said to me, um, that many Chinese believe the United States wants to contain their, their growth and development. Do you believe that? Does the United States want to contain China's development? Actually, during President Hu Jintao's visit to the United States, the U.S. government and President Obama himself said on many occasions that the United States 
hoped to see prosperity and development in China and believed that this would serve the world and the United States. I believe in what, the, what your president said. What do you think uh, the biggest misconception about your country is from America in general? <laughs> I don't think this is misconception. It is more of a lack of understanding. What do you want us to understand? Well, in the first place, it is not easy to really know China because China is an ancient civilization and we are of the Oriental culture. And for the Americans, the United States is the world's number one superpower and the American people, they are very simple people. If they choose to, if they are asked to choose to understand a foreign country, their first choice would be the European countries and the South American countries may come second. It was not only till recent years that the American people have begun to pay more attention to China. But over the years, American media coverage of China have been scarce, and if there were some coverage, most of them are lopsided. What do you think about this question of misconception and understanding? You know, the, the thing about America and the world is that our role in the world, we took on this huge role in the world well ahead of the understanding of Americans about what's happening in the world, and that's changing now. And, you know, when I went to China to study Chinese about 30 years ago, it was a unique, exceptional thing. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, there's tens of thousands of Americans studying in China, studying Chinese all across the United States. And you're starting to see a much greater investment by Americans in understanding, you know, not just China, but all the countries that are so important to our interests. And that's a, it's come a little late to the United States, but it's changing quickly now. And I think it's very important because our capacity to advance our interests as a country Will depend much more now going forward on the quality of understanding we can be we can bring in be, we can bring to these basic problems. That starts with uh, understanding uh, again the basic interests and traditions, values and intentions of a country like China. So as we can see from that clip, we can under wait just a second. Wait, what did Timothy Geithner just say? You know, when I went to China to study Chinese about 30 years ago, it was a unique, exceptional thing. You know, I think I've heard that in passing before, but I've never really let the penny drop there and realize just what an incredible thing that is. Here we have the ex-head of the New York Fed, who just happened to have studied in China. He speaks Mandarin, and he's able to converse with, with his Chinese counterparts in their, in their native tongue. Not, and it, again, that's, that is kind of incredible when you start to think about uh, where that's coming from, and especially once we know that the Chinese have been being set up as the next great superpower for, by the global elite for a long time. So it's only fitting, I suppose, that the people who were being slotted into place as the next generation of banking overlords, or at least banking puppets, would uh, be people who had been trained in China and were very familiar with the culture, wouldn't it? And we can find out a little bit more about that uh, by from a WSJ, a Wall Street Journal blog entry from 2009, which blithely admits, quote, not only had Geithner studied in China, but his dad helped establish the Ford Foundation's Beijing office years ago. End quote. Absolutely incredible. But those are the types of things that you learn when you actually start listening to these people instead of just listening to the, the uh, other side talking about these people. So... I certainly don't want this uh, this information warfare movement that we're involved in to become simply an echo chamber, and I don't want people to simply get all of their information from alternative media sources like the Corbett Report. Of course, I certainly hope that you do understand and, and take into account what the, the alternative media is putting out there, but certainly it's valuable to take a look at what the elite insiders are themselves saying and to analyze what's going on underneath. So again, there's some interesting tensions slash non-tensions going on between Geithner and Wang Qishan in that interview that are worth our attention and worth scrutinizing because it says a lot about what we might expect in the future. And we might be able to then situate uh, Brzezinski's crocodile tears about the rise of China and the, uh, the global political awakening that we listened to at the beginning of today's episode. And that might all start to come into some sort of perspective.
But that's a lot to talk about, and we have talked about an awful lot in today's episode. I know it's sort of a flurry of information, so I would not expect people to take all of this into on board in one go. But I certainly hope that you will use today's uh, episode as a starting point for taking a look at some of these very fascinating conversations and uh, speeches and other things that I have linked up in the documentation section for today's episode. And I certainly hope that you will start taking a note of what people like the Council on Foreign Relations and other elite insiders are saying, because when we are listening to the enemy, we can understand what the enemy is thinking and what it is likely to do next. That's all for today. I am your host, James Corbett, thanking you for joining me and asking you to join me again next week for another edition of The Corbett Report. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report 2009 Video Archive. Buy your copy today at corbettreport.com.